Here are a few people who completely took advantage of their situations. Fraud Advisor Bilal Abbas had a taste for the finer things. He loved Rolex watches, luxury vacations, designer brands, pink champagne, and flaunting his cash on social media. He was a frequent customer at the jewelry store, David Summerfield, where he spent thousands almost every day. But David Summerfield jewelers started to grow suspicious of their loyal customer when Abbas's friend, Jordan Hamilton Thomas, came to the store three days in a row to purchase Rolexes worth nearly $20,000 each. The next time he went to the store, a police officer was waiting at the door. Hamilton Thomas pushed the officer out of the way and ran away, but he and his co-conspirators were quickly caught. Police later uncovered that Hamilton Thomas was part of a three-man operation to steal people's bank information, and it was all traced back to Abbas. Abbas was employed at Santander International Bank. Ironically, he worked in their anti-fraud unit. As a member of this department, he was granted access to confidential customer details, and it was his job to protect this information at all costs. Instead, he did the opposite. Over 14 months, Abbas stole people's bank account information and card numbers, selling them for over $100,000 to his accomplice, Umer Maimon. Maimon used the customer's accounts to purchase luxury items and fancy vacations. Abbas listed himself as a fraud advisor on his resume. He stated that working in a bank requires trust, honesty, and good mathematical skills, all qualities he had. Oh, the irony. The three-man scam of Maimon, yeah! Hamilton Thomas, and Abbas spent over $100,000 of customer savings on Dolce & Gabbana, Versace, Spanish resorts, Rolex watches, and jet skis. They didn't try to hide their riches either. They had photo shoots with wads of cash and even took pictures pouring Laurent Perrier pink champagne and vodka all over Rolex watches. Their crimes were uncovered because an employee at David Summerfield Jewelers had a hmm. gut feeling that something was wrong and called the police. Police. police investigated the men in April 2018 and quickly realized that they were spending a suspicious amount of money that didn't align with their salaries. The prosecutor detailed how Abbas completely destroyed customers' trust and left them feeling distressed and anxious. He stole from the people he was supposed to protect. Data from 21 customers and 13 businesses in the UK were stolen and sold. Abbas was sentenced to two years behind bars. Maimon got two years and three months, and Hamilton Thomas got two years and two months. Thankfully, all of the victims got their money back. In addition to the massive scam, Maimon also pleaded guilty to dangerous driving, and Hamilton Thomas pleaded guilty to assault with intent to resist arrest. A spokesperson from Santander was happy to see these three men brought to justice. One Fund the Boston Marathon is one of the most famous marathons in the United States. Athletes train for years for the chance to prove ultimate endurance. On April 15, 2013, what was supposed to be a joyful and fun challenge for runners and their loved ones turned into tragedy when explosions went off near the finish line, leaving three people deceased and 260 injured. One Fun Boston was set up by the former mayor of Boston, Thomas Menino, and former governor, Deval Patrick, to help victims and their families receive resources and treatment after the tragedy. The One Fund was tremendously successful and gave nearly $80 million to the victims and their families. It used an additional $1.5 million to create programs to support survivors receiving long-term care. As people rallied around the victims and their families, with an outpouring of love and financial support, Andrea Gauss saw the perfect opportunity to make a profit. Andrea Gauss was a 26-year-old New York native and mother of two who claimed she suffered a traumatic brain injury after the Boston Marathon incident. She filed a detailed claim that said she had long-term memory loss, impaired speech, and loss of motor skills. She claimed to be treated at Boston Medical Center for two days after the bombing and Albany Medical Center Hospital for 10 days after that, which would have racked up thousands in medical bills. These lies allowed her to claim $480,000 from one fund to pay for her hospitalizations and support her recovery. Shortly after receiving her payout, Gauss made a $377,500 down payment on a home in Clifton Park, Massachusetts. Not only that, but she signed up
up for a hero's cruise specifically dedicated to the survivors of the Boston Marathon. The Boston Attorney General's office received an anonymous tip that Gauss wasn't even in Massachusetts during the bombings and was lying about her supposed injuries. After some investigation, police found that Gauss was never a patient at either Boston Medical Center or Albany Medical Center Hospital. All of the paperwork was completely fake. She was arrested, pleaded not guilty, and held on $200,000 bail. Though she denied any wrongdoing initially, Gauss later pleaded guilty to larceny at the Suffolk Superior Court. Prosecutors wanted a four to five year prison sentence, the maximum sentence for theft. Her relatives took the stand to defend Gauss, saying that she didn't commit a crime and that the charges were just a big mistake. But the court had a hard time believing her innocence when it came out that Gauss had tried to scam the law 15 times since 2005 with charges including larceny, forgery, and possession of stolen property. Gauss was sentenced to two and a half to three years in state prison for defrauding one fund. The money she swindled from the charity was recovered and dispersed to real victims. Gauss is out of jail now and we can only hope she's learned her lesson. Or maybe she's trying to scam the COVID Paycheck Protection Program. Going viral. In October 2021, a TikTok went viral of a Waffle House employee holding a baby while preparing meals. The video was captioned, ain't no why she got her baby in here, shaking my head. People were shocked by how unsanitary and unsafe it was to care for a child while cooking customers meals. Others were saddened by how this working mother had no choice but to take care of her baby while on the clock. The 12 second video got more than 3.7 million views in two days. A TikTok user named Tiffany Clark reached out to TMZ claiming to be the woman in the video and gave a tragic backstory to the situation. She said the baby's name was Octavia and she wasn't her baby but rather her brother's who had already passed away. She said the child could have been taken away by social services if she hadn't taken her to work that day. Clark said she wasn't cooking with the baby in her arms and was only just setting up plates. She also said that Waffle House was so upset by the TikTok that they suspended her from work for a week. As soon as this woman came forward claiming to be the mystery Waffle House employee in the viral TikTok, the media ran with the story and posted her cash app in the hopes of sending her money to support her and baby Octavia. TMZ, the first media outlet to speak with Clark, didn't post the woman's cash app, but many others did. And it's a good thing TMZ didn't post the link because as it turns out, this woman wasn't actually the Waffle House employee. Though the video is semi-true, the backstory shared with the media was a complete lie. People who donated to cash Cash App just bought into a scam. Waffle House's VP of Public Relations told TMZ that they investigated the TikTok video and found that the social media posts about it were completely false. Though they acknowledged that a Waffle House employee really was holding a baby while on the clock, the baby wasn't related to her by any means. The real woman in the TikTok never reached out to the media nor shared her cash app. Waffle House also never suspended her from work. The truth is that the baby in the video was a co-worker's daughter who the employee was trying to calm down. The employee has since been trained in proper safety and health precautions. The scammer is still out there with a TikTok profile with more than 14,000 followers. We still don't know how much money she made from these lies. The Great Exploit in April 2021, six people were officially arrested and charged for scamming the National Disability Insurance Scheme, NDIS, out of $10 million over four years. The scammers were five men and one woman in their 20s and 30s. The ringleaders were Mohammed Salam and his wife Nora Bader and his brother Muath Salam. The other accomplices were Gazwan Sharouk and Ahmed Musa. Another man, a 37-year-old Frenchman named Jagertha Zafrain, was also arrested as a person of interest. They saw NDIS as the perfect opportunity to steal. They set up fake companies and then submitted inflated invoices to get rebates from NDIS. The ringleaders alone received more than $3 million in fraudulent payments. Their greed drove them to steal money from disabled Australians who really needed it. But what exactly is NDIS? 
The NDIS provides financial support to Australians with a permanent and significant disability that impairs their ability to work and make an income. By 2027, the NDIS is projected to give out $22 billion to roughly 500,000 Australians. It also connects disabled people with community resources such as doctors, sports clubs, support groups, libraries, schools, and information about the support available in each state and local government. The team of six scammers consisted of three companies that worked to obtain funding for people who didn't have a disability. They also received rebates for people who do genuinely have a disability but had no idea that money was being claimed on their behalf. They collaborated with NDIS participants and service providers to inflate claims and receive the funding they were not entitled to. Once they received the cash, the money went right into their pockets. The ringleaders paid Gazwan $40,000 to set up a bank account under his name dedicated to receiving these fraudulent payments. The Australian Federal Police estimate that they stole more than $10 million in NDIS funding, making it the largest fraud case in the agency's history. They spent the money on anything and everything, including sports cars, gold bullion, cryptocurrency, and even nose beers. 11 search warrants across Sydney revealed that the team of six had a treasure trove of valuables, including eight kilograms of gold bullion with an estimated value of $600,000. They also had $600,000 in cash, another $600,000 in cryptocurrency, and a large amount of jewelry. Several sports cars, including a BMW M3, Audi Q7, and Porsche Cayenne, worth over $250,000 were seized and towed by the police. They were arrested in April 2021 and spent the night in jail before appearing in court. They were all granted bail except for Muhammad, the ringleader. The others were given very strict bail conditions in which they had to surrender their passports, forbidden to leave New South Wales, and can't be involved with any company that provides NDIS services. Muhammad Salam and his wife got hit with some pretty heavy charges for ripping off NDIS. She was also accused of enrolling NDIS participants, using fake documents, and submitting claims for services she never provided. She had a history of failing to comply with court orders. All of them are currently out on bail as of June 2022 while they await their fates. The investigations into the scheme continue with more arrests anticipated. The Cougar Willard Ross Lanham was a former New York City Department of Education consultant who was convicted of stealing $1.7 million from the school system. He defended his crimes by saying he deserved some sympathy due to the lavish spending habits and exploits of his cougar ex-wife. He claimed that his ex-wife, Laura, was going through a costly midlife crisis involving nightclubs and dating young men in their 20s. He said the situation drove him to steal funds from the city's school system to support their 16-year-old daughter. According to the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, Lanham worked as a consultant to the DOE and managed multiple initiatives, including Project Connect, which was intended to provide internet access to all public schools in the city. During his tenure, he was the man in charge of Project Connect, in addition to two other initiatives, and was responsible for hiring contractors and subcontractors to execute the projects. He made $200,000 per year for a total of $1.4 million during his six years with the DOE. Apparently, that wasn't enough. Without approval, Lanham used $1.7 million of DOE money intended for Project Connect for his own personal use. He did this by using his own outside consultants through Lanham Consultants. Then he used Lanham Enterprises to pay the consultants directly. He billed a Project Connect subcontractor for work done by Lanham Consultants unrelated to the DOE. The amount he billed for was much greater than the actual rate, so Lanham could pocket the difference. Then he told another DOE subcontractor to bill Lanham Enterprises for the same amount and use his company to charge another subcontractor an excessive amount for the same work. Again, he pocketed the difference. In both cases, Lanham Enterprises didn't contribute anything to the actual work that Lanham Consultants was doing for Project connect. Yet, the DOE was paying for all of it. The scam went on for nearly six years, allowing him to pocket $1.7 million in addition to his $1.4 million salary. He used the money to buy luxury cars and purchase and develop Long Island real estate. When Lanham appeared in court, he asked for leniency because his cougar ex-wife had spent all their money. To prove his point, he spoke of how Laura Lanham posed her pics online and was an internet blogger on a website called Cougar Life and called herself a yummy mommy who was proud to be a cougar. She said she only joined the website after 
after the financial difficulties following separating from her husband. She submitted photos to Playboy and embraced the cougar life after realizing she enjoyed attention from younger men. She called it an empowering experience that allowed her to flirt and have fun without the long-term commitment most older men are looking for. After hearing that her husband used her midlife crisis in his defense, she was furious. Laura argued that everything her ex said about her was a complete lie and called him a master manipulator who has been a cheater forever. Laura wanted to turn her husband's failed scam into her own success. The 42-year-old vowed to be America's next big reality star. She went on Good Morning America, Inside Edition, and Dr. Phil to tell her side of the story. Unfortunately, the couple had to continue living together in their Long Island home on Laura Lane, a street named and built for her due to financial difficulties. Talk about a tense household. The scandal has wreaked havoc on the lives of their three children. Ultimately, Lana was found guilty of four counts of fraud and theft and faced up to 70 years in prison. He was eventually sentenced to 37 months. In addition to his prison term, the judge ordered three years of supervised release and a $100 special assessment fee. He was ordered to forfeit $1.7 million and an additional $1.7 million in restitution to the DOE. But it seems like the city didn't learn its lesson. Even after Lanham was convicted, the DOE hired custom computer specialists again, the company that worked closely with Lanham while scamming the New York school system. Despite the red flags, the DOE has awarded the company over $21.5 million in contracts since 2011. Click to watch one of these next videos. And let us know in the comments section what's the most ingenious scam you've ever heard of or seen yourself.